So uh, hello, and welcome to this coffee break session on pipes in R. My name's Henry and I'm a third year PhD student at UT Health San Antonio. And I've been doing bioinformatics for about three years now. And um, one of the things that I found really useful in the R programming language is the pipe operator. But I found that it's kind of a mysterious topic. Not a lot of people know about it. So I wanted to give a little bit of background and kind of show you in some practical examples, how you might use this in your own programming. Okay, so this is a, a pretty famous work of absurdist art. Um, and it says at the bottom, actually, I'll just ask, does anybody speak French? Does anyone know what that says at the bottom? It says, this, this, is is not a pipe. Pipe. this is not a pipe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it says, this is not a pipe. So this is very ironic uh, because as we know, that actually is a pipe. But the larger point that Rene Magritte was making was that in fact, literally it's not. Literally it's a painting of a pipe. And when you deconstruct how things actually are from the words we use and the symbols we use to represent them, you can try to understand what they really are in their essence. So while this is ironic, there is actually a corollary to this in R, the pipe operator, which just like the painting is ironically not actually a pipe. So let me, let me just talk a little bit about why you would use this, what it will do for you, and just a little bit on what its limitations are. Because when I say it's not a pipe, I, I do mean that in a computational sense. But okay, so I'll, I'll start with what this actually is. So let's say that you want to do an analysis, and that's going to involve taking some data, wrangling it into some final format that you want to either plot or present or do something with. So typically, the first step is going to be just sort of deconstructed here to take your data in its raw form and process it into a new form. And then you might take that data that you've now processed a little bit, and you might process it further, and so on and so forth. And these might be the typical steps in a data processing workflow that you would have in R. And the point of this is to take your raw and unprocessed data and then make it clean and processed. One of the things you'll notice here though, is that there is a lot of extraneous data uh, intermediaries that get generated while you do this. And so in many ways, this is quite inefficient because you don't need data two, three, or four. It's just that they happen to be a byproduct of you going through the steps in your workflow. So instead of conceiving of our workflow like this, it might be more helpful to think of it like this. And whether or not you've got intermediaries in the middle, these are the basic tasks you're hoping to accomplish to get you from where you've got your raw data to where you've got your process data. So the whole philosophy behind the uh, pipe operator from the, the Magritte R package is that you can take these workflow steps and turn them into a unified pipeline. And for all intents and purposes, as the user, you don't even have to see the pipeline like this. You can actually see it like this. And we'll talk about later why this might not be really an accurate representation, but for right now, when we're thinking of it in its most basic form, you, you can think of it this way. So I'm gonna be talking a little bit about tidyverse and R for data science here. So this, this largely comes from the tidyverse realm of packages in R. These are packages that all work together to allow you to do basic data science approaches. And the R for data science book is a really fantastic free book that teaches you how to do tidyverse operations in order to process data. And so if you're not familiar with tidyverse or you're not familiar with R for data science, I highly recommend checking them out. Okay, so I just wanted to make that plug before uh, I actually jump back into the R code. All right, so um, hopefully you have all gotten the, um, the R pipes or pipes.R, okay, actually, let me, uh, let me close this out here. I did not need that. My bad. There we go. Okay, so hopefully you've all got this. 
So the first thing that I want to do is um, if you don't already have Tidyverse installed, you can go ahead and install it with line 16 through 18. So that's basically going to check whether you have Tidyverse installed on your computer. And if you don't, it'll, it will just install it. And along with that, it'll install the Magritte R package, which is technically part of the Tidyverse. So that when you run lines 19 and 20, you'll actually be able to load both of these up. Okay, so let's take a, a nice sort of simple example here. So let's say we have some data. And in this case, our data is a vector containing a exclamation point pipes and hello, all in caps with a space. So we can see it show up here in our environment panel when we run, uh, run line 26 by just hitting control enter or I think command enter if you're on Mac. And if we actually just print words to the screen, we can see it show up here. It prints it nicely as a vector. So let's say we want to take this data and we want to turn it into a nice formatted sentence, maybe like hello pipes, exclamation point. So to do that, we can convert it to lowercase. And so that's what the to lower function does. So now everything is lowercase. We can see it's lowercase. We can reverse the order of the words so that hello pipes and exclamation point are in the correct order. We can do that with the rev command. So now you can see they're in the right order. We can paste them together into a sentence using the paste command. And we can use the str2 sentence function from the string r package, which is loaded with the tidyverse in order to convert this into the correct capitalization or correct case. So this is a sentence case that we're gonna apply now. And so sentence case is gonna take basically all the sentences in your character here. It's gonna find them and then it's gonna convert the first letter of the first word to uppercase. So it's pretty smart. And then finally, we can, we can print the sentence using the cat command. It says, hello pipes. Okay, so one of the things that we talked about was how you can take something that has multiple steps, like we just saw here, this is several steps in this workflow, and you can actually combine that all into one continuous pipeline using the pipe command. So let's actually take a simple, very simple example first here to understand how the pipe command is working. So let's say that these are our words, we're going back to square one here. If we apply the to lower function on these, we've already seen what that does. It makes it here uh, all lowercase. But we could actually do the exact same thing with the pipe command by piping the words data into the to lower function. So it does the exact same thing. These two lines are doing what is essentially identical. So the way this is working is that it's taking the data and it is sending it to the function as the first argument. So rather than directly supplying it as the first argument in line 52, it's more like we're taking it and we're placing it there, but not directly. And that might seem convoluted. It might seem like kind of an obnoxious extra step, but we'll see in a second why it's actually quite nice to be able to do this. So let's say I wanted to then take the output of this, which will be my modified data. Let's say I want to now pipe that in to my rev command. Whoops, my rev command. So that's very easy to do. And now it's in the correct order. And I can go on like that the whole way. I can go into the paste command now. and so on and so forth. Because what's happening is we've got data, it's being fed into this function, which outputs a, a modified set of data that goes into the next function, which modifies it further, and then so on and so forth. The common way to represent this in a situation like the one we have now is to put each step of the pipeline on its own line, and then separate them with the pipe operator. So this is that same full pipeline just in essentially one step. 
The nice thing about this is because this is considered sort of like one line of code, you can put your cursor anywhere on here and it will work the same. It doesn't matter where you put your cursor to run this. Okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions about what I've talked about so far here? Okay, um, so feel free to stop me at any point. This is, it gets sort of complicated pretty fast after this point. Okay, so let's say that you don't want to just print words to the screen. Let's say you want to assign this to some new variable. Well, you can actually do that pretty easily here. So we take our pipeline like we just had it before, and we can now assign the output to new words, which is a, a variable here. So it doesn't print anything to the screen this time, but it gets assigned to the new words variable. And then we can print that new words variable if we want with the cat command. Something that I think maybe most people don't realize is that um, there is, in some cases, some reasons to use the arrow as opposed to the equal sign. So right hand assignment is actually one of those reasons. So I'm going to do the exact same thing I just did, except with instead of a left hand assign, I'm going to do a right hand assign. So we assign that to new words too using a right hand assignment, and we can see that it worked the exact same way. Let's say that you don't want to. Oh wait, and actually, let me let me just pause because I I know that like not everyone knows this, so I'm going to just pause and. Um, I'm going to make this a little bit more interactive. What do you think would happen if I attempted to do this, where I did left hand and right hand assignment at the same time? Does anyone know what happens if you try to do this? Won't it error out? OK, well, let's see here. I'm going oh, to no. make this. No, wait, sorry. I was thinking two left hand assignments. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make new words three and new words four here. You can do dual left and right hand assignment at the same time. You can do them simultaneously. And in fact, I think this is like a fun challenge question. To ask people, because like, what will this produce? Will this give an error? No. All of them are on one, right? Wow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's, there's no reason that you can't do this as long as you're using arrow operators instead of equals. Not that I advocate for this because it's kind of ugly, but like, it's cool to know you can do it. Anyways. Yeah. Um, all right, but in Magritte R, there's actually a special kind of pipe this dual sided pipe that you can use to take the output of a pipeline and reassign the original variable to that output. So basically overwriting the original data set. So we're gonna take words here. Words is just, it's kind of our raw data and we're going to overwrite the words variable with our process data that, that only comes out of the end of the pipe. So we can see here, it doesn't print anything, but words has now be reassigned to hello pipes. So it's kind of cool. So something you might have noticed, and this is where things get a little bit complicated, something you might have noticed is that it seems like we can either print or we can output something, but it doesn't seem like we've ever done both at the same time. So I want to ask, does anyone know what would happen if we include cat in this pipeline? We're not, we're not reassigning anything at this point. We're just including cat in the pipeline. So does anyone know what would happen if we do that? I think I you know, I mean, it will only, you know, print the sentence. That's right. Yeah, it'll only print it. Yeah. So it does print it. It does print it. Okay, well, we've jumped a little bit ahead there. We've jumped a little bit ahead, but yeah, that you're right. What if we tried to do this and reassign it? What do you think? What do you think words would become? What do you think the output? Uh, what what words would be at that point? So I mean, I've already tried it, but <laughs> um, it. I mean, I won't say what it becomes, but it'll just 
the reason it becomes what it becomes is that it's no longer a variable. It's something that has been sent to output or to the whatever the output terminal is of, of your script. So it's not actually a, a, a thing of data anymore. Yeah, that's that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So okay, we'll we'll take a look at this. So it printed correctly, but words is now null. So the reason it's null, um, and actually I've got one more example here. Um, the reason that it's null, and we're gonna we're gonna see the same thing here. Um, okay, so so in this one, we put cat higher up in the chain. We see it printed correctly again, but instead of getting null this time, we've got an empty character. So the reason that this is happening, if we take a look at our cat commands manual page by doing question mark cat, we can see that in the section of the manual that describes the output of the function, it says that the output is none or null. And essentially what that is telling you is that when you're in your pipeline and you're, you're going along, you know, the input comes in here, output is now the input to the next one, output becomes the input to the next one, and they're passing inputs and outputs all the way along. If one of these is cat, if this second one is cat, for example, and the output is empty, well, that empty output now becomes the input to function three. And if it's the last step, then that empty output becomes the final data. Okay, so the question is, how can we get a pipeline where we can have both cat working and it correctly processes everything? Getting our print to the screen and getting everything correctly processed and stored in the words variable. So the Magritte R package authors actually came up with a really cool way to do that using something that they call a T pipe. So um, I just wanna show you here sort of the intuition behind how this is working. So let's say that this is our pipeline. And now that we understand how the pipe operator typically works, we know it's actually something that looks a little bit more like this where you've got your data being piped into your functions and then it's all passed all the way through and then finally you get your process data. Well, if we want to take, for example, function two and we want that to run, but we don't want function three to be dependent on the output of function two, then we can actually do that with a T pipe. And this is what that looks like. So the T pipe operator is a pipe operator that basically says, I want to give you some data, but I don't want to pay attention to what you do with it. Basically, you've now created an independent branch of your pipeline where nothing that happens in that independent branch is ever going to influence the rest of the main pipe. So it gets the data from the main pipe, but then it never returns it back. And that's what a T pipe does. How are the, you know, output from that? So um, there are some things you can do. This is one of the main limitations of pipes though. I'll just say that now. There's, this is one of the things that makes them limited, but I'll show you some tricks you can use that are actually pretty cool. As long as you don't need anything from this in your main pipe, then this will work. That's kind of, that's the sort of general rule of thumb with this sort of thing. Okay. So let's take a look here. So the T pipe is basically going to pass the data from two lower onto the cat function, but now this is isolated in its own branch. The cat function's output is not going to make it back into the rest of the pipeline anymore. So we're gonna see it printed, but the fact that it returns a null is not gonna have any bearing on anything else. Sorry, my internet cut out real quick. So you may have just said it and I missed it, but can you, is, oh. when you branch off like this, is this a one-off where you can only use one function or can you have like a rat tail of stuff happen in an independent branch of the pipe? 
Yes. Uh, I'll show you in a second. I, I've got an example where we do that, actually. Um, okay. But yeah, sorry, I accidentally forgot to run line 118 before I tried this. So you can see here, it printed it correctly because um, it only prints after the two lower steps. So it's that's the point we're at here. And we can see that words has been correctly assigned as the sentence. So it does work. It works quite nicely. Okay, um, and of course we can we can also take this whole thing um, and put it at the end here as well, so that um, we can see it printed the nice full statement printed, but we don't have to return it back to the words object. So we can see here it prints the whole thing, but words is still correct here. Okay. So um, before, before I jump into like a more complex example where you might actually see how you would potentially use this in some actual work that you're doing, um, does anybody have any, any questions about this? Okay, cool. Well, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you this example then. So uh, I really liked Star Wars when I was growing up and um, I was really excited to see that in R they have a built-in data set called Star Wars. Um, and if we, if we look at it here, let's go ahead and print this to the screen and so it actually shows up in our environment. If you look at this, it's actually all the sort of main characters from the Star Wars franchise with like various um, information about them, like their height and weight and stuff like that. Um, so I thought this was kind of a fun, <laughs> a fun data set. Um, one of the things that I might want to ask for some reason, maybe I, I'm trying to win a bet online or something like that on some fan forum. Uh, one of the things I might want to ask is whether um, Gungans are actually taller than humans. So like Gungans, if you remember, uh, from the first Star Wars movie. I mean, not not the actual first one, the the episode one, uh, Phantom Menace. Uh, Gungans, like Jar Jar Binks, are represented as about the same size as people, but they actually seem slightly taller to me. So I might argue that Gungans, by and large, are actually taller than humans. Um, and then Wookiees are a nice positive control because, as we all know, they're very tall. So... Just so, just so we're all, you know, on the same page with this. Um, I also limited the sex to male, just to keep things a little bit more standardized. Um, and also, I said it so that um, if there's an NA value for their height, that we just remove that sample. So this is a filter from dplyr, which is in the tidyverse sort of universe of functions, and. Um, it's something that hopefully you're all kind of familiar with or you, you've heard of it before because it's just very, very useful. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and filter the data set. And now we can see we're, we're left with 28 rows and they're all the, uh, the males from these different uh, species, human, Wookiee and, and Gungan. And yeah, got their heights. Okay, so the first question I wanted to ask here was, uh, what is the average height for each species? And so to do that, I used the group by command from, again, tidyverse. So we're grouping the data by species. And the only thing that that really changes about the data is that you now have this little message here that says the groups include species. So that wasn't there before. Um, and then now that we've got groupings, we can summarize the data to get the average height. And so when you do a summarize in, in tidyverse, not that this was like a lecture about tidyverse, but when you do this, you're getting the average within groups, if the groups exist. It's going to find the average within each group. So we summarize and print, and now we can see the average height for each species. So I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, well, I guess I was, you know, I was right. Gungans are taller, but someone might say, well, how do you know if that's really significant? I mean, I want to see your, you know, I want to see your like box plot. And um, so then we would actually move on to, to do that with plotting and with significance testing. Um, but before we do that, we might want to actually streamline our workflow here a little bit by adding pipes. Okay, so here's how you would do those same steps that we just did using only the pipe operators instead of having to continuously assign and reassign things. We just take our data, pipe it into our filter step, pipe that into our group by step, pipe that into summarize, 
and we'll see here produces the exact same results. Okay, so before we go on to the plotting, does anybody have any questions about uh, about this part? This is probably the most likely way that you would actually use the, these pipes in the wild because they synergize very nicely with tidyverse. Okay, um, so let's now do a, a nice box plot to show our three species here. And so uh, I already have the Star Wars underscore males data set from back up here earlier. So this isn't actually from my pipeline yet. So we'll have to deal with that later. But I made a nice little plotting function here so we could take a look at um, how those, uh, <laughs> you know, how those boxes look. Okay. All right. So we can see here our three species. Um, human and Gungan seem to be different, but our, um, I can't remember what interquartile range is overlapping. Isn't that what, the, is that what that's called? I hope that's what that's called. Um, the whiskers on the box are overlapping. And um, that makes us completely, you know, not completely confident that these are really significantly different. Um, but we have a bigger problem, which is that we haven't yet figured out how to incorporate this into our pipeline. And so it's actually pretty easy to do because ggplot is also part of the tidyverse. So it works completely fine with the pipe symbol. And so you can take your data, pipe it into the filter, and then pipe that into the ggplot. And then the whole thing just works. Let me remove this so you can see this. But yeah, so you can see that whole thing works. Pretty nice. All right, so the question that I would have is, well, this is nice and all, but I still don't know what the means are. It, you can't really see it very easily on the plot. Um, so I want my means to be printed to the screen at the same time that I do this. And so we should be able to do that as long as we know how to use the T operator correctly. So going back to the T operator, before when we used it, it was in a simple case. Now we have a more complex case because to get that summary, we needed to do group by and summarize. And actually there's an implied print function at the end here that we didn't even call because we didn't have to at the time. Um, but now we'll have to because we're doing it inside the context of a pipe that is closed. So this is the T operator for a more complex multi-stage operation here. Okay, so there's probably a few questions from this. I'm gonna go back to the presentation really quick here. So when you have a more complicated T pipe that includes maybe a few additional steps, one of the things that has to happen is you have to enclose the steps that are specific to the T pipe in brackets. And the reason is because this, this pipe operator here doesn't know if you're still in the T pipe or if you've gone back to your normal pipeline. And that's the issue. So to, to make it clear that you're still in a T pipe, you enclose it in those in those brackets like that. It's actually called making an expression, but I'm not gonna belabor that point. So we enclose this in brackets to make it an expression. Um, one of the other things that happens when you make an expression and you also need to have um, these pipe operators working inside of it with these sort of dplyr verbs one of those the things that happens as a side effect is that you have to supply the data explicitly to the first argument using a, a dot so that basically that basically says explicitly take the data from the previous step in the pipe and use that as the input it's a bit convoluted i'm not really sure why the authors of the package haven't changed that yet because i'm not really sure what that adds in terms of value but just so you know if you want to use this you will have to explicitly supply the data to the first argument using a dot. Okay, anyways, um, does this work? Yes. Okay. Um, one more thing I wanted to do, because we still don't know if these are significantly different, is actually to do an ANOVA and a Tukey's post hoc. And so we'll do our ANOVA, we'll do this nice and proper, we'll do a one-way ANOVA, uh, we'll do the, the two key HSD, um, and then we'll see if these are actually different. All right, so if you're doing this in just like the totally normal R way, you would just give the data set and you would do like a formula to the AOV function, which is just the ANOVA function, and then you would run the two key host, post hoc on it. 
And then you would see, you know, for my comparison, human versus Gungan, is that actually significant? And it, it does seem to be significant. Pretty cool. But we want to make sure that we can do everything with one command only. Um, I don't know why, but let's say that we're really bent on only doing things in one pipe. Well, there's really no reason why you have to leave things like this. You can actually add a totally other T pipe. You can actually add as many as you want, basically infinitely. Um, there's no end to, to the amount of uh, complexity you can add into these pipes. All right, so what we're basically doing here is this was our first T pipe that where we printed the mean values. And then now with another T operator, we're making a second T pipe. And so you can actually do this, um, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward to add another one on top. The only thing is, again, put it in curly brackets to make it an expression and then explicitly supply the data using a dot. OK. Just to prove this actually works. Oops. All right. Um, so we get our plot, we get our means, and we get our uh, post hoc test results printed. And there you have it. So, um, not that I would ever advocate really doing something so complicated, but I hope you can see now how uh, customizable this can be and how uh, how much this can actually streamline a lot of the stuff we do with our basic data analyses. One of the limitations, of course, that was brought up earlier is that you can't bring this back into the pipeline. So there's no way for the output of this to come back and be a part of the main pipe. What you could do instead, though, is you could save it to a file. You could actually manipulate an environmental variable, a global variable, from within a T-pipe. Not that I ever recommend doing that because I really don't, because that can get you in a whole lot of trouble, but you could if you really wanted to. Um, so there are ways to break out of a T-pipe and actually influence something that's going on outside, but they're not great. So in general, I would say most of the way that you'll end up using this is gonna be just a normal vanilla straightforward pipeline. And yeah, so hopefully this is now giving you a good idea of how you can use tidyverse and in particular the uh, Magritte R pipes from the tidyverse um, in order to make pipelines that can actually have multiple branches and you can use to clean up your code and um, keep better track of how your workflows are running. And with that, thank you all so much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Henry. He was like very, I mean, the interesting. I, you know, haven't done this. I mean, the, uh, I mean, the, um, the T ones, you know, I have done the, it's just the, you know, you know the, I mean, the simple one, yeah. I learned how to use those specifically to talk about this today. Cause I was like, I bet there's a way to do that. And, and I eventually found it. Um, but yeah, definitely kind of a niche, niche technique. I think most people just use the normal, the normal sequential pipe. What's really crazy is there's actually ways to do with like uh, background processes, like using future and stuff like that. There are ways to actually send parts of your pipe to the background and then bring it back later. There's actually all sorts of crazy stuff you can do even beyond this, but um, definitely not for the faint of heart. <laughs> So is Magritte R part of the tidyverse? Like, does it load with the tidyverse um, package? If you just library tidyverse, do you get all of Magritte R? It loads part of it. So for example, if you only load uh, the tidyverse library, um, mm -hmm. at least in the version of R I've got on my computer, it won't load the T pipe. It'll only load the, um, the normal vanilla pipe. Okay, yeah, because I remember using pipes plenty of times, which is the regular tidyverse, but I was unaware of the T. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. Any other, any other questions or, or comments? Okay, cool. Oh. Well, I do have a comment. I have a question. 
but sure. it's more of a personal question because it has to do with what I'm wanting to do. Yeah, go for it. Close to it, uh, what you showed, but I haven't been able to figure it out. So I have three variables that I want to plot instead of just like with it nested within each other. So I have two treatment options, but I have five, five, I think, <laughs> I should know, um, time points. And so I've been trying to graph it. And I don't know if it's, I haven't used R in a while. Looking at while. So I can't quite remember how to think it through, but I haven't been able to get it to graph. Yeah. Like I said, that's more of a personal question. That's but something I like that I, I know what you mean. I have to literally, every time I go to do something like that, I always have to Google it. Um, and in fact, there's a specific phrase that I always Google to get to get that um, page. But yeah, it's um, it's GG pub R orange juice. <laughs> um, and it's this first one. <laughs> So I know it seems really silly. Oh wait, that that wasn't. Oh no, did they did they change it? No. Ah, uh, this is killing me. Um, but anyways, no. I think they've they've now uh, moved it. But yeah, so there's a way there's a way to do it. But I apparently have now lost the Google search that I always did in order to get it. It's on Data Novia though, um, somewhere on here. But they've changed their website apparently. Shoot. Sorry about that. But yeah, no, I know what you mean. And yeah, if you Google it for about five to 10 minutes, you'll find the example where someone does that. That, And then once you find it, maybe you can also send it to me because I don't remember where it is now. <laughs> oh, I just realized I muted. Okay, yes, I will. I've already started Googling. I will nice. let you know. But yeah, okay, cool, cool. Were there any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, well, um, yeah, thank you all so much for your attention. Um, and yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully you'll start using these if you were not using them before. <laughs>